this is a two-part presentation. Um, Richard Harrison and myself are going to talk about some stuff we did to build a multiplayer RTS game. And then uh, Alexi from Unity is going to talk more about the new networking API. Um, and so hopefully there's time for everything. And uh, if we run out of time for questions at the end, I think we'll all be available afterwards. So feel free to come talk to us then. Uh, so Homeworld Deserts of Karak, it's a ground-based prequel to the original Homeworld title. Uh, we shipped this in January using Unity 5.2. And uh, it looks like my fonts aren't quite the same as they used to be, but that's okay, at least you can read them. Um, so first of all, kind of taking a step back, what is a multiplayer game? Um, you can sort of think of it as it's a shared virtual world. That's kind of how we, how we internalize it and imagine it. We imagine that uh, if I'm the red guy, then my opponent is directly controlling the yellow guy and we're duking it out and having a good time. Um, but of course, we're actually playing over the internet. We're distributing our commands through a series of tubes. And uh, what we really have is simultaneously experienced replicas of a virtual world. We're not actually in the same world. We're in copies of the world that need to stay synchronized. Uh, so how do we replicate a virtual world? How do we stay synchronized over those, uh, those tubes? Um, here's one way. Uh, we can do turn-based replication. I could call my friend up and uh, you know, move E2 to E4, and the pawn advances. Um, this obviously works for chess. I played chess over the phone with my friend when I was a kid. It was kind of slow, but it was fun. Uh, but there's styles of games where that doesn't seem to work. Um, so a first person shooter like darts, you know, if I call up my friend and say aim in such and such a way and throw with such and such a force, you know, it's, we're not going to be synchronized. Uh, even if you could attempt to do this and my friend is super accurate and takes my instructions really well, he's probably going to throw slightly off and the dart is going to land in the one instead of the 20 and the game's going to desync and it's going to be horrible. Um, I could just tell my friend, hey, I hit triple 20 again, but he might stop believing me after a while. <laughs> so one way of achieving replication is client-server. Um, all, the, all the players in the game send their inputs to the server. Uh, the server runs the game simulation and sends all the results back to the clients, and they display it. And everything is synchronized because we're all just being given copies of the state that was updated by the server. Um, but the tubes, uh, so the length of the tube you can think of as latency. It's like how long does it take uh, to issue a command and receive an acknowledgement that that command is, has been performed. The width of the tube is bandwidth. How much state can you shovel through that tube? And uh, both of these are important factors in a multiplayer game. Um, for an RTS game, uh, there's a lot of state information in the game. Um, so every unit has a position, it's got a speed, it's got health, it's got power, it's got a bunch of other attributes. Uh, it may have one or more turrets. The turrets have an orientation. Um, there's a, you know, how much ammo do I have in my gun at the moment? Um, how many projectiles have I launched? What's the cooldown until I can launch the next projectile? Uh, how many abilities are activated? Um, you know, am I, uh, where am I moving towards? Which units am I trying to attack? Which group of units am I considering for attack targets? And buffs, which are basically attribute modifiers that are a big thing in RTS games, potentially every one of those attributes could be dynamically modified on the fly. So I can't just rely on everyone having a read-only copy of the attributes to start the game, because those things are constantly changing. And take all that, multiply it by 800 units, and uh, that's a little too much for the tubes. Um, bad things happen, and the game slows down or, or just doesn't work. Um, so taking a client-server approach to an RTS game, uh, as the internet has evolved and bandwidth has improved, it's probably getting to the close to, to a point where you could just about consider that approach. Um, but we still take a what's called a peer-to-peer -peer lockstep deterministic approach where everyone is running the simulation independently, which is what I'm going to talk about more. So yeah, couldn't we just get each computer to run the same program? I mean, computers are good at doing exactly what they're told. Can't we just tell every computer to do exactly the same thing? And it'll all be glorious. So that's kind of what we did. We took our game and uh, made a, a deep and concrete s separation between simulation and presentation. Uh, the presentation layer is all the Unity stuff. That's where user input comes into. Uh, that user input is turned into commands to the simulation. So if the user bandbox selects some units and then right clicks on the map to give a move order, that command becomes a little packet of data that gets passed as a command to the simulation, which then uh, runs that command, updates the state of the sim, and passes state information back to the presentation layer. 
Uh, and this is just a quick definition of what I mean by a command. It's basically a little packet of data describing an operation for, this, for the simulation to perform. Um, so now we're kind of coming back to turn-based replication again. Uh, so in our game, we've got this big six-wheel monster truck called a base runner. So a command might be something like, you know, uh, set a move order for this particular base runner to go to this specific point on the map. Um, and commands are easy on bandwidth. The commands are pretty light. So if we've got two, two people playing, uh, we can transfer commands over the tubes, and you know, they're pretty, pretty skinny commands, so we can, we can send a lot of commands very quickly. It's a light piece of data. It's much lighter than the amount of state information we need to pass. So basically what we're doing is getting this, this lightweight stream of commands uh, transferring between, you, between the different players and the simulation executing those commands uh, in a lockstep fashion on every computer. And the state, you know, if we do it right, the state is the same for everybody. So what's the catch? What could possibly go wrong? Um, turns out determinism is tricky. Uh, computers aren't quite as uh, logical and repeatable as you might expect. Um, there's a bunch of limitations. Uh, so a key thing is no state changing API. So basically separating the presentation and simulation very clearly and not allowing the presentation that's running along willy nilly at some random frame rate to interfere with the state of the sim in any sort of direct fashion. Everything has to be through commands. Uh, a fixed update rate. So we basically need to run the sim at a lockstep time uh, ticking fashion. So everyone's sim is updating at the same rate. The same commands are being performed on the same sim tick uh, in order to keep things in sync. Uh, this is an annoying one, no floating point numbers. 32-bit um, and 64-bit processors, AMD versus Intel, Mac versus PC, uh, you know, some crazy optimized JIT compiled IL that gets run on a vector processor. There's a lot of different floating point units, and even though there's an IEEE standard for how to deal with floating point numbers, uh, the chip vendors will generally take shortcuts to get performance back. So you can't always rely on the low bits. And as soon as one bit desyncs, then eventually something bigger is going to desync, and one guy's going to hit a target, another guy's going to miss. One guy's going to hit the one on the dartboard, another guy's going to hit the 20, and you're going to have this butterfly effect that causes a desynchronization. So no floating point numbers, which means no physics, at least no NVIDIA physics, because that's full of, of floating point numbers. We can't use that in our deterministic simulation. We also can't use Unity, because Unity is going to use a ton of floating point numbers. <laughs> However, it's fine to use Unity on the presentation layer. This is about making multiplayer games in Unity. We are a, multi, a, a Unity studio. We do use Unity extensively. Uh, we just don't use it in the simulation. So digging a bit more into the, uh, how we separate things, and the rule is commands in, state out. So uh, user input generates commands. They get buffered up. The SimTick executes those commands and updates the state of the game. Um, a snapshot of game state is then queued up and put into a, a queue that passes to the presentation layer, um, which can then interpolate that state at whatever render rate it's running at and uh, update the display and make everything look pretty and the user is, uh, is happily playing the game. Uh, and just to, to reinforce the fact, presentation must not affect the simulation except through commands. Uh, you can imagine a simple thing like if um, you know, if I had a, a public API that was calling a random number and the presentation called that at some random time, consumed another random number, then the sequence of random numbers in the simulation will diverge. Anyway, there's a bunch of reasons why we, we can't mess with state. So our solution, and I actually mean our Visual Studio solution, um, was set up in such a way to make it pretty easy to play by those rules. Um, we've got a lot of projects in the solution. The key ones are um, bbi.game was our simulation. If you look at the things this refers to, there's almost nothing. There's a core library we have, and there's system, and there's some data classes. Uh, you'll notice there's no Unity engine dependency in that assembly, so we couldn't call a Unity API if we wanted to. Um, the presentation layer is bbi.unity.game. We're not very imaginative with our project names. Uh, this depends on absolutely everything, because it's using Unity, it's using PhysX, it's using a bunch of third-party stuff, um, and can kind of do whatever it wants, as long as it doesn't mess with the sim. So Visual Studio for code builds, uh, clear dependencies between projects. Um, we use a lot of uh, internal classes. So within bbi.game, within the simulation, there's a lot of classes that are internal scope, which means other classes in that assembly can call them, but another, an external assembly cannot call them. So that gives us a way of preventing presentation layer from calling into the simulation, because it can't see those internal classes. 
Uh, we also run the simulation on a separate thread, which is something we couldn't do if it depended on Unity because we get those annoying exceptions about you can't do that on that thread. Um, it also means that it kind of pushes simulation and presentation even further apart and makes it even harder to, for the presentation layer to interfere with the sim. Um, and then to keep track, to debug desync problems, we, uh, every time the sim updates, we compute a checksum of the sim state, and those checksums are transferred over the network along with the commands, so that if anyone's checksum differs, we know that we've got a desync, bad things happen, we pop a, a dialog to the user and say, sorry, we screwed up, your game desynced, you've got to stop now and try again. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, during development, we can take the, the uh, state frames transferring from the simulation to the presentation, dump them out to file, and when there's a desync, we can like crawl through all that data trying to figure out what changed. Um, in practice, we had very few sync bugs during development, which was fortunate, and I think in large part due to the way we, we were pretty disciplined about setting up the project structure to make it difficult to make mistakes. Uh, fixed point math, so no floats, so we, um, integers are deterministic, all the CPU vendors are good on that, so that's fine. Uh, as I said, probably necessary, I know a guy who works at Intel, he couldn't tell me it was okay to use floats, so I'm like, okay, I'm out, we're, we'll use fixed point. Um, it also enables cross-platform play, so we, we do PC versus Mac play, and that worked fine. We do 32-bit versus 64-bit, that worked fine. Uh, in theory, if we had a high enough powered tablet, and we understood how to build an RTS game on a tablet, you could play tablet versus PC. Um, anyway, it's all good. Uh, reasonably straightforward to implement, kind of slow. It becomes like this tax on every operation you're doing, so that's annoying. Um, you need to decide how to handle edge cases. If you overflow the range of your fixed point number, do you want to correctly uh, generate infinities and not a numbers and things like that, or you just want to tell your client code, don't do that? Um, you also need to decide what you want for your fixed point numbers. We use 64-bit longs and sort of arbitrarily decided we'd have 32 bits of fraction and 32 bits of, uh, of integer part. Um, there's a Greek guy that could have told us that was a bad idea because it uh, turns out the square distances are something you use a lot in games. And with a 32-bit integer representing meters, if you go beyond 46 kilometers, we can't square that distance anymore without overflowing. Um, and a couple of our maps were longer than that. Uh, so we did get some overflow in our computation of distances. Um, fortunately, we, ch we did do the right thing with infinity, so if we were checking a, a range check, uh, then the guy with the gun would see that the guy he's trying to shoot at is infinity far away, and no, his weapon range isn't infinity long, so we're all good. So we kind of dodged the bullet on that one, so to speak. Um, this is just gives a quick taste of, of uh, what fixed point math implementation looks like. I'm not gonna go into the details there. These slides are all available, so um, they're gonna be online on a Google, Google presentation. You guys can get that after. Um, another issue we ran into was attribute tuning. So uh, RTS games have tons of units with tons of properties, and designers like to mess with those all the time. Um, and because we, our simulation isn't using any Unity objects, we can't pass it a mono behavior. We can't pass it a scriptable object. Um, so how are we gonna get tuned data into the sim? Um, what we ended up doing was defining a C-sharp interface representing properties that we needed on a unit, uh, creating a serializable data type just with the system.serializable attribute uh, to hold those attributes and implement the interface, a scriptable object that wraps that data type and then becomes an asset in the project that the designers can inspect in the inspector and tune the values on. Um, and then at load time, we, we pull out that serializable data inside the scriptable object, and that we can pass into the simulation. Um, we also implemented buffs by having a buffable version of each attribute type that took the base attributes as a member, and then the various buff overrides, and then the, the, uh, because the sim was using that data through an interface, as long as the buffable class implemented the interface, it didn't care that the values might be uh, changing on the fly based on the buffs being applied. Uh, a little more code again to show what this looked like in the interest of speed. I'll gloss over this pretty quickly, but basically there's an interface that the sim understands. There's a uh, serializable class that we tune through a scriptable object and a buff version of the class that, that allows dynamic overrides. Um, so I knit, said no physics. I don't know if anyone's seen our game, but it's giant trucks lumbering through the desert and launching off sand dunes and throwing up dust. So it sure looks like we've got physics. So what do I mean by no physics? Uh, what I mean is no NVIDIA physics in the deterministic sim um, because we don't have control over that math and can't, can't force it to be deterministic. So what we actually did is, is our game is a 2D simulation 
Uh, every unit has um, a position on the map, an XY position, and a current heading. And we had a bunch of vehicle physics that runs in 2D and understands you know, drifting and acceleration and deceleration. And uh, it can actually have a pretty rich two-dimensional model of unit movement. Um, we also have a 3D presentation layer. It's Unity 3D. We've got a roving camera. Um, and in the presentation layer, we do have you know, X, Y, Z position and all three degrees of, of orientation. And basically what we do is we lock down three of the degrees of freedom and let physics mess with the others. So the simulation is dragging the unit around, physics is bouncing it up and down, and uh, everything looks like it's gloriously three-dimensional. Um, so I haven't said much about multiplayer, so getting back to that, uh, what this, this is demonstrating that we, we have this, the simulation is running on every client. Uh, commands are being shared between players over those tubes. And commands are sent from the presentation layer into a scheduler. And what we do is we schedule a command for execution some number of ticks in the future. And that number of ticks is tuned to accommodate for the latency in the connection. So when we get to um, executing sim tick K, we need to make sure that we've received a command packet from every player for that tick. Um, if the player hasn't actually issued any commands, we still kind of give a, a no operation command packet. Um, if we don't have input from every player, then we need to hold up the sim and wait for that packet to come in. And when that happens repeatedly, we'll start increasing the scheduling horizon. So by increasing that horizon, we make sure that the, the scheduling interval always provides enough time to, for the commands to circulate through the network. Um, in the image here, I've shown that uh, all three players have all the commands for tick K, but they're still in the process of accumulating them for tick K plus one and tick K plus two. So as long as we get them all before we need to execute the sim, then we're good. And if it all works, we get that simultaneously experienced replicas of a virtual world that we were shooting for. So one thing this allows is a pretty cool replay mode, which uh, Richard is going to talk more about. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, I mean, Iggy talked about how uh, the de deterministic simulation kind of replicates the same game on multiple different machines. Um, what that also allows us to do is if you wanted to re-replicate that same game again later, you can actually do it as a replay. That's easy, right? You just do all the same stuff. It's not exactly. Um, so we have the, the typical presentation simulation in, uh, relationship. All the commands go to the simulation, comes back as state to the presentation. As the game is going on, what we do is we save out all of those commands to uh, like a replay file. That can be a text file, you make your own format, and effectively all it is is just a list of commands. Uh, when we're ready to then go back and replay that replay, we flip things around a little bit, and instead of reading commands from the presentation, we read commands from that replay file. Now, uh, it's on a high level, basically that. Uh, a little bit more in detail, we have our presentation sending commands to the scheduler. The scheduler sent, uh, groups everything up, sends it to the simulation. And then when we want the replay file to kick in, it takes over, we get rid of the player, we don't need him anymore. Except we sort of do. So when you actually send a command, the command is an action, it's when, when that command happened, and it's also who that command belonged to. So if we don't actually have the players in the game anymore, the simulation doesn't have any way of validating that those commands belong to anyone, um, so it wouldn't be able to know where to send those commands or which units they belong to. Um, so what we actually do to solve that is we make a bunch of dummy players. They sit in the game, they just are placeholders, and they don't actually do anything other than represent the faction or the team or whatever, whoever owns the units in the game. And then every time the replay file sends in a command, it checks it against to make sure that there is actually a player in the game, sort of, that, that can handle that, and then it actually runs it through the simulation. So, then if I'm watching this replay and the game is actually being played back and I've got player one, two, and three, what happens if I was player one before? Who am I in this game? Well, we introduce the concept of an observer player. And the observer player is actually a, a player in the game, but they have, similar to the dummy players, no ability to actually issue commands to the simulation. Uh, the reason for that, obviously, is that if we are watching a replay and it's all uh, calculated to happen in a certain way 
and the observer player then sends a command, it's going to desync the whole thing because it's not playing the same way that it was originally. But the observer player does need to be able to interact with the game because we need to be able to pan the camera, select units, uh, toggle fog of war, even change the rate of the sim tick if we want to pause or slow down the replay, for example. But all of this has to be kind of cleverly done through presentation layer only. You can never, ever, ever send any commands to the simulation. It's pretty easy to just block somebody off from being able to send commands to the simulation, but to be able to manipulate the top level data can kind of be tricky, but that comes a lot into just the architecture of the actual game structure itself. Uh, the file format of the replays uh, is basically just header info and then a giant dump of all of the commands that actually happen in the game. That header info, though, has some really, really important stuff. Have the level setup, say your game mode or the map ID. You have your player list, which is names, IDs, uh, whether they're human or they're AI, faction. If you have any DLC, say mods or skins that the, the units might be using. Um, the random seed is incredibly important. So when we start a game in any game, there, there is a deterministic random seed that gets passed through into the game, and that gets used to generate any random decisions in the game. And as Iggy was saying, that has to be the same on both machines, but it also has to be the same in the replay. Uh, this goes for um, slight unit tunings if they decided to veer left instead of veer right. Uh, it also goes into uh, every single AI decision that is made in the game. So I'll get to that in just a second. Um, game version also is really important, and I'll touch on that in, in, a, in a moment. Um, so the AI. The AI actually doesn't send commands the same way that a player does. So how do we actually save what the AI is doing to make sure that it plays the same game as, as before? The thing is, the AI actually has no idea that you're watching a replay. Uh, it's basically playing through this game as it was before, and you're watching it, and it thinks that it's real life. Um, it literally replays the game, and it uses the same random seed, and that's why it's so critical that when you replay this replay, it feeds the same information so that all of your AI logic makes the same decisions over again. Um, so what is really the benefit of saving replays this way? Well, our final size was approximately about 20 kilobytes per replay file, and it's more or less a more or less a text dump that gets compressed and then loaded at runtime. Should we have saved the actual state uh, of everything that was happening in the game, we'd be looking at more like 10 megabytes per frame, <laughs> which is something in the range of like 10 gigs for a file. And this would be for every game that was actually being played, and if you have auto-saving replays, like you're just gonna destroy hard drives. Um, one small caveat is that that's full state and not deltas, so what you could actually do to optimize that if you had, say, a smaller scale game, is that you can uh, save only the things that changed in a frame as opposed to a kind of redump of everything that actually exists in the game. That's only going to save you so much when you have 800 units in the game that are all doing different things at all times. Um, so really, it's for a game that is of this scale, probably not a good idea. Uh, challenges. There are challenges, of course. One is that it relies on determinism. And as Iggy was saying, determinism isn't super easy. It's not just a walk in the park. Um, unfortunately, to get replays to work this way, your solution is to be deterministic. Um, there's really no way around it if you want to actually have replicated replays that are replaying the game. Uh, another big challenge is rewinding. So it may not be super obvious on the surface, but the simulation actually has to play forward. There's a lot of logic in the simulation that doesn't make sense if you play it backwards. You can't undo a unit dying. You can't undo a unit jumping off a cliff or something like that. Um, there sort of are solutions. They have been done. You can quick load checkpoints. Uh, well, now, what do I mean by that? Let's say you're watching a replay, and you are 90% of the way through the re replay. As we go through the replay, you define kind of a constant amount of time, or maybe a number of frames that have taken place, and you do a single state frame uh, save. Uh, this is usually during the runtime of a replay. Uh, what that allows us to do is that, say I'm here, and I want to go to here. 
it will actually jump back to the last checkpoint that I had available that it saved during the replay and then fast forward as fast as it can. Um, it's kind of brute force, but it works. Uh, you, the limitation here obviously is that depending on the number of stuff, uh, number of units that are happening in your game, the complex, complexity of the logic, you may not be able to actually fast forward your simulation really, really fast. So you might have to hide this behind like a loading screen or uh, maybe save checkpoints more often. Of course, the caveat of that is that the more checkpoints you save during runtime, the faster you're gonna run out of memory. Um, another big challenge is that new tunings invalidate old replays. Uh, not super intuitive, but basically what this means is that if I have version one of our game and a base runner in one simtick moves this, this far, and then we update the game and all the designers are like, ah, base runners need to move faster. Now it moves this fast. So this is a problem because if I replay this replay now using new tunings, it's not gonna happen the same way. Base runner is gonna make it to the other side of the map faster than it did before. So what can we do? Uh, you can save old tunings. Uh, every time you update your version of the game, you take all of the old tunings or even maybe just the things that changed, you save them out to some local file, and then when I load the game version, sorry, when I load the replay, I look at the game version, I look at the replay tunings that actually match up with that game version, and I pump that into the simulation, and then I actually run the replay with that information. Uh, on a similar note, new code invalidates old replays. Now this one's quite a bit more complicated because it's not data necessarily has changed, it's actually logic. Um, so let's say base runner drives a little bit, and then we change logic. Now base runners have rockets and they fly. And it, you can't say that, well now it's just moving a little bit faster, I can't change the tunings, it's that the logic itself is different. So how do we do that? Uh, well you can save old executables potentially. Um, that could get kind of bulky, but you could potentially save, uh, dynamically load only the old DLLs that have changed. So if you take all your unit logic, and you save them into separate DLLs, you could potentially dynamically load those DLLs for purposes of, of, of logic changes. You could also potentially write a converter. So you could take old versions of the replay, maybe up, upload them to some web-based client or something like that, or you maybe send it out with the game, and you could convert them to a state dump, or maybe convert it to a, an actual video format of the, of the replay or something like that. Um, one thing to point out is that this was not actually in our requirements, so while we, while we theorized about these solutions, we never actually tried to implement any of them. Um, not the end of the world. Anyways, uh, when it all comes together, basically, we have a really cool game that can be run deterministically, multiplayer, on multiple different machines, and you can seamlessly, sort of, take that information and then send it back through replays and actually be able to watch replays. Here's a little video of that actually happening, if the video will play, which I don't know if it will. I think I have it back up. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So th this video was actually uh, created from a replay that was taken from a recent tournament that some fans of ours ran. Um, so they, they've been doing an ongoing series of tournaments every couple of weeks. And uh, this is part of the end game for one of the semifinals from, uh, I think it was a game on October 22nd between two of our top level players. Yeah, cool, and that's our section of the talk. Um, Alexi's gonna come up and talk a little bit more about the low-level aspect of that. Uh, Owen, can you go to our slide for a sec? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not it, oh shit. 
this go into the monitor? Oh, weird. Okay, never mind. How many programmers does it take to fix a PowerPoint presentation? Is it serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the comment I was going to make is uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the guys from Age of Empires who uh, published an article called 1500 Archers on Gamma Sutra back in 2001. And almost everything we're doing, they did it 15 years ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Alex and I represent the UNET team, networking team from the Unity. Actually, I am working with low level API. So. <laughs> Any bugs, any problems which you have, it's my fault. I'm sorry about it. And a couple of months ago, we introduced a new transport layer because actually we've got a lot of feedbacks, a lot of bugs from you, and we've got a lot of use cases which we didn't expect. And yeah, we rewrite it. And right now I'm going to talk about new transport layer. Why? <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to talk about C++ implementation, actually not C Sharp, because I think that you guys need to know what's happened under the hood and what you can expect from the uh, system. <laughs> and uh, plus how it, uh, you, need, you need to know how it to config, because we've got a lot of configuration parameters and we've got a lot of questions about how the system should be configured and for reducing forum questions for us. Uh, what about new transport layer? Uh, what's the changes, actually? First of all, right now, it's a new transport based on the bandwidth, not for the frame rate. This means that before you're going to use the library, you should define what is your bandwidth, how many kilobytes per second you're going to uh, send through the wire. Default parameter like 150 megabytes per second. <laughs> so I guess you can use everything what you want. Uh, the second, we improved scalability. Uh, it's very uh, important for the server. Right now, I guess we can uh, handle thousands connections. And all of them have got the O1 asymptotic. We uh, we work on stability uh, and actually we provide a lot of stress testing with the new implementation. So right now I can say that new implementation is much more stable than the old one which you're using right now. We compressed protocol and moreover we compressed, uh, we changed the way how we can work with uh, reliable packets. So the problem when you've got in the log files no free event for the message, this problem should almost go. As well as we create, it's quite important things too, we create the server DLL, it's just product which you can, can use separate and create the server which you want without Unity, it's just library. And it works for Linux, Mac, and Windows for sure. When we introduce, when we, we can use the new transport, first of all, you can use it right now because we published the last version of the Unity, public Unity, we accomplished with <coughs> new transport layer and <coughs> public in form. And you can expect, I guess, the final realization is the 5.6. And a few words about why we design like this one. Uh, we divide the, our network layer, network transport, uh, to the two different layers. One of them is totally C++ implementation, and we work on performance and take, <laughs> take into account performance and flexibility of this C++ implementation. On the top of them, there is a high-level API which actually was implemented like, like example how network transport should be used. And uh, you can create the, any C-sharp layer on top of uh, uh, transport layer. Moreover, you, after, after you implement this, you can publish it in an asset store, like library. Uh, 
well, logical view. Uh, the system is contained from the library itself. It's a unit manager, which got the global configuration. After that, it's the host, it's the layer, it's the entity which represents socket, actually, and it got the configuration which named host topology, and after that, it's the connection, like this one. Connection got configuration two. Connection contained from the, connection inside got the different channel, up to 200 channel you can use, and each, each channel <coughs> got the quality of service. Reliable, unreliable, sequenced, unsequenced, fragmented, unfragmented, and so on. Uh, between connection, actually, through the boom, 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 give me a second, yep. We send packets, user send messages. So <coughs> when you send messages, library inside pack the messages in the one packet, and after that send through the wire to your peer. As well as imagine that you've got following picture. You create the game and you've got 16 player per room, for example, but you still need to connect to the chat server or lobby server and so on and so on. So it's external connection, which got the external config. Here you see it. I, for example, create the lobby server. It's this one, which got default config. And here, and you create the game. You create this one, this one, this one, and this one. So between your configuration, you're using default config. To connect to me, you use external connection. And all of this inside reuse one socket. And so when you send data, actually you ask your net manager to, to ask host, to ask connection to X channel, send the message. And when you receive data, you receive data from channel, from connection, from host, from unit manager. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> internally, uh, the system uh, divided to the three different parts. One of the parts is the parts which belong user space. Another part, it belongs to the worker thread. And the worker thread usually do pack, uh, do pack and pack of uh, decode and encode works. It divides the packet to the messaging and combine messaging in the packet. And the last thread which we, which we use is the audio thread. Mm -hmm. Actually, which sleep and waiting for IO operation. When you receive that data, it's awake and uh, signal worker thread to do some work. Uh, configuration parameters which you need to know is the following. There are two configuration parameters in the global config, but it's actually not required. Global config uh, define memory pool where we allocate the data. And the value here, 1,000, means that allocate me please 1,000 packets. But if you will go, <coughs> more packets should be pre-located. It will be allocated. Two, host I've got the parameter which limited amount of messaging or packets which you can send and receive. <coughs> so here, send message pool size is 1,000. If you try to send more messaging before all of this messaging will sent out, you will receive error on the send and no resources. Each connection of got configuration parameter of max send messaging queue. And if you will try again, send more messaging, then, <coughs> uh, then do not send yet, you will receive no resources. The third parameter is the retransmit buffer. Retransmit buffer is the, is the buffer where messaging waiting, reliable messaging waiting, waiting before they will be acknowledged. It's got 32 or 64 uh, length size. And uh, if again, if you will try to send more than 64 reliable messaging, you will get the no resources. The same, the similar picture with receiving message pool size. 
if you will receive more messaging, then you will bump out. So, and in the incoming queue will be more than 1,024 messaging. Uh, the incoming packet will be dropped. How, this drop rate will be calculated. Your peer will be notified about that we dropped 10%, for example. And after that, your peer probably will decrease the bandwidth. When it will be, it will be decreased bandwidth before. <coughs> okay, give me a second. Sorry, what's up? Yeah, here. So the parameters here, overflow to double threshold. Just define the percent when the packet can be dropped before bandwidth will be decreased. If bandwidth will be decreased to the critical limit, you will disconnect. Okay. Uh, let's and the last parameter which you need to know is the parameter. What's the sorry? Mm -hmm. This one. It's the, how often IO thread will be awake to do timer job and uh, <coughs> check if a worker thread gets the something to send. Its parameter is quite important if you do the uh, m m mobile uh, games because actually one millisecond will drain battery quite fast. So take a look on these parameters and what's happened with battery of your phone. So global config. Here, the one parameter which working on the server side it's this one, thread pool size. It's how many worker thread you're going to start to handle uh, um, packing, decoding and encoding work. And yeah, no more important parameters here. I just point the slide because you can, uh, after session you can check and check the full parameters and check what it has. The second host topology. Host topology have got the couple of important parameters. It's receiving message pool size, send message pool size, and uh, it's got the list of special config. So you can create the, some special connection to connect to the server which you want, third party server. So here you see the host was configured to have one, two, three, four, five, six, six connection with default config, and we add the two external connection or special connection to connect to the external servers. Uh, connection config, uh, what we should know here. First of all, we uh, just remove, going to remove a couple of parameters. Uh, don't use these parameters because they actually do not get any effect on the performance and how system works. Uh, packet size. Packet size is quite important because uh, we don't have um, automatic pass uh, discovery. So this means that your network probably can drop packet when you, during the work. For example, we've got the following bug. Uh, it was Xbox One. The size of the message size was about 50, 500 bytes. And periodically, the system was disconnected. <laughs> the deal was some, uh, it, it was a Wi-Fi environment, so you can expect that some messaging will be dropped out and then retransmitted. 500 plus 500 plus header is 1.1K. One, 1.1K 1 point one K. One point one K, one K is the uh, size of the packet when Xbox, uh, firewall on Xbox will just drop silently. <laughs> so just, um, I suppose that before you 
start working with the network, we just can check how many data you can send in the packet just before the work and after that set up the packet size. Disconnect timeout. Disconnect timeout usually means that if I don't have any data from my peer for this, this timeout, I will close. If the bandwidth, if you send the message, and I understand the according to bandwidth, current bandwidth, I couldn't, I couldn't send this message for the disconnect timeout, I will close. Ping timeout. Uh, we've got keep alive packets, which actually fired every ping timeout. It contain, usually it contain <laughs> timestamp and it contain drop information. How many packet was dropped by network condition and how many packet was dropped because buffer, internal buffer of server was over full. Uh, network drop threshold. <laughs> it's another problem which we've got. Uh, default value is 5%. In Wi-Fi environment, you can expect that it's 10% as minimum. So if you don't change this parameter, you will definitely got disconnect. Change it, please, to 80%. Overflow drop threshold, it's up to you. It's how many, uh, if, uh, well, what's happened with server? If you don't dry in server fast, the packet will be dropped on the server side and uh, your bandwidth will be decreased. Uh, send delay. Send delay allow you combine messaging in the one packet. Imagine that we send one message and the message is small. For example, I don't know, 100 bytes. In this case, overhead, UDP header, IP header, our header will be 50% of the, your messaging. Uh, it makes sense to wait a little bit. Probably there is another messaging which we can, can combine with the first one. So send delay defines this value. Egg delay is a parameter which, uh, again, situation is the following. You've got the server which just silent server and you've got client which sent and sent and sent and sent messaging. The question is, when the server should send the <coughs> acknowledge back? If it will be sent acknowledge for each messaging which it received from the memory, you will got a lot of just small packet which got only one egg. It makes sense to wait a little bit and acknowledge more than one messaging. It's a millisecond, 33 millisecond by default. Uh, is act long defined um, what's the size of retransmitting buffer? It can be 32 or 64. I would recommend start with 32, say 32 and if you've got the problem with reliable messaging, change it to 64. Initial Initial bandwidth, it's uh, zero here, but you can set up it, I would say 100 megabyte per second, you can try, <laughs> probably will work. Uh, the last two parameters, bandwidth speed factor, it's quite difficult to explain, so just forget about this one, it's a good value. WebSocket receive both buffer size, and when you work with the WebSocket, you need to define uh, size of the, your messaging. The deal is, by default, uh, operational system usually and library usually uh, uh, allocate 4K, 4 kilobytes. And if your messaging, which you send through the TCP, will be more than 4 kilobytes, it will be dropped by the library. <laughs> so just check this parameter, please. UDP socket, by default, SPEP, it's, by default, it's 4K. UDP socket receive buffer max size. Uh, it's uh, actually receive buffer of UDP socket. It's defined how messaging, how actually how many UDP packets can wait on the UDP socket before it will be acquired by library. But again, situation, imagine that you set up to one megabyte and you've got uh, one, 100 bytes UDP packets. This means that on the socket, couple of thousand packets may be already expired. 
will write before it will be consumed by library. So check this parameter too. And yep, what here? Uh, for debugging, uh, I recommend first of all on Windows using Clumsy. If you don't know, it's a network simulator which can simulate lock and drop packet. Very useful tools, tools very easy to use. Uh, as well as uh, very helpful Wireshark, when you can actually check what you send. Uh, what else? Uh, yep, and for, uh, very often I've got the, on conference, uh, on forum questions about uh, timing. We've got the timing service. So this means that using get network timestamp function, you can just grab the, some sort of digits. You can add the digits to your message. And when you receive this message on the other side, using get remote delay time millisecond, you will receive the how old this message was. So it's for example, this message was fired 10 millisecond ago. So you use it. What else uh, I want to say before we go into example of program? Uh, network, actually, uh, network games, uh, it's a multiplayer games. It's not uh, games which will work in multiplayer. Before you start <coughs> design your multiplayer games, you need to calculate how many messaging, how often you're going to send. Probably after that, do network test. Is it work or not? For example, if you lack got 800 millisecond, most probably you couldn't create the RPC. <coughs> okay, and after all, it's just an example of program how transport can be used. It's quite easy. Uh, we create global config, we init library, we create connection config, we do something with connection config, customize it. We, after that, we create the topology. After the, uh, here, means that host topology will using this config, and we allow default only one connection. We, we change, you see, we change received more, more messaging pool size here. After that, we call the add host. It's, this host will create the socket on the port 9999. After that, you call connect. And that's it. Uh, in update, we, you need to persistently call, uh, we, 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 you need persistently pump the library. Uh, and the pumping is uh, quite easy too. There is a function received, which will, re, uh, which, will re, uh, which will return some sort of event. If you don't have any event, it will be return nothing or it will be returned connect data on disconnect, and variable, oops, variable inside will explain you what host ID, what connection ID, what channel ID uh, will return the data, buffer will contain the data if it will return, um, and the data size will be returned the actual size of the data which you receive. I guess it's quite easy and quite straightforward. Important part here is this one. You need every update, you need grab, try to grab more than one message because you probably on the one frame, probably you can receive a couple of hundreds. I don't know. And that's it. Thank you.